Hey guys, I'm back. This is the middle of page 30. But those plans shriveled once Theo died. There'll be no California without him. That's why I have to convince Harkin to let me stay. I'll do better next time, I tell him. I promise you that, sir. He slams both fists on the desk. We won't win this war on promises. Please, I don't want to hear it. But Trevor mentioned Operation Zirfall. Harkin freezes at the mention of that last word, dumbfounded. What did you say? Trevor started talking about an Operation Zirfall tonight. His eyes darken. What do you know about Zirfall? Nothing, sir. Nothing at all, but I've seen the word on one of your files. I gesture at the folder right on his desk. I thought it must be important. What did Trevor tell you exactly? That he overheard his handlers talking about the operation and, and that it's going to change the course of the war. Harkin does something I'd never seen him do before. He pales. What else did he say? He mentioned a name. Supposedly there's a man named Reinhardt who's in charge of the whole thing. In the dim light, Harkin gropes for a pen and paper. I need you to tell me word for word what both of you said tonight. He's about to settle down onto his chair when there's a knock at the door. Sabine slides inside and I toss her a frosty glare, but she doesn't notice me. She's focused wholly on Harkin. Major, she starts. What is it? It's Monsieur Bordelon. He's just arrived. He says he needs to speak with you. Harkin doesn't look up. Tell Arenda wait. He says that he brings news about the mission in Reims. My head darts up. A mission in Reims? I hadn't heard a thing about that. Reims is a city east of Paris, about halfway to the German border. Covert Ops has had a few missions there, mostly to collect downed Allied airmen and deliver them to safety. But by the look on Harkin's face, I somehow doubt that Loren has brought news of another retrieval mission. Send him in, he says to Sabine, before his gaze rakes over me again. We'll continue our conversation later, Blaze. But, I pitch my voice lower so Sabine won't hear me. Please give me another chance. I can't go back home. He points at the door. Out. Now. With a shaky nod, I exit his office right as the grandfatherly Loren enters it. He's one of our most trusted contacts within the French resistance, and he usually has a smile for Sabine Tilly and me. Les filets, he calls us. The girls. But tonight, his face is grim. Whatever update he has brought about Reims, it has to be important enough for him to break curfew. In the hallway, Sabine shuts Harkin's door while she holds a glowing candle. You're quite lucky. I didn't see any trace of the Nazis around this store. I know I should ignore her, but the words leap out of my mouth anyway. I made sure to shake the Nazis before I arrived. I'm not completely useless, you know. She tilts her head to one side. That's not what I said. You sure did imply it. It surprises me how sensitive you Americans can be. She sniffs. It's as if you are looking for possible offenses. I'm about to brush past her when we hear a pounding at the hatch. Five crisp thumps. Footfalls descend from the ladder and soon Tilly steps toward us, dressed in a plain brown dress and an even plainer brown shoes. An incredibly ordinary outfit that's perfect if you want to blend into a crowd. And when you're as tall as Tilly, over five foot nine, you need every ordinary detail to count. She's certainly a sight for my sore eyes. After Harkin's tongue lashing and Sabine's gloating, I didn't realize how much I needed to see a friendly face. What are you two gossiping about? Tilly says with her usual grin. She pulls off her long mahogany wig to reveal her auburn hair beneath it. Were you talking about how pretty I am? Sabine's lips twitch a little, the closest she'll give to a smile. Why, of course, Matilda, she says using Tilly's full name. Then her mouth tightens. Loren is here. Oh, the cheer recedes from Tilly's face. At this hour? I wouldn't retire for the night in case Major Harkin wishes to brief us. I'll be in my room. Sabine hands us the candle and disappears into the darkness. She must have eyes like an owl because I don't know how she isn't bumping into the walls or tripping over her shoes. Tilly hooks her arm through mine and leads us to our shared bunk room in the opposite direction. You better fill me in on everything, she whispers, right before she flaps onto her creaky cot and sets her wig on the old milk crate she used as her nightstand. How was the mission? Do I need to start calling you Agent Blaze from here on out? I wish I had better news for her, but all I can remember is Harkin's fury. I don't know. It's up to Harkin, I guess, I say, deflated. She gives me a puzzled look, so I tell her everything. About Traverd, about the pistol, about the Nazis who heard the shots. When I'm finished, Tilly sighs and moves over to my bed. Look at it this way. 
You took out the target, she says, gently patting my back. You completed your mission and you escaped. How can Harkin kick you out when you did what he sent you to do? You should have seen him though. When I told him about the patrols, she winces. Did he blow a fuse? More like he blew every fuse in Paris. Let's not jump to any conclusions. He could be in one of his moods again. Maybe, I say, but I doubt it. Tilly hadn't been there when Harkin reprimanded me. Granted, he did tell me that I was the perfect agent on paper, but paper doesn't do much good in a war zone now, does it? After Tilly retreats to Ricotta, I let out a sigh of my own and open the lone drawer of my nightstand where I keep my valuables. To anyone else, they're not really valuable. Just a square of chocolate, a bar of lavender soap, an empty glass bottle, and the V-mail letters that Theo wrote before he was killed. I carried these letters with me when I parachuted into France, and I've read them so many times that the papers have gone soft, all except the last one. It still hurts too much to read it, even six months later. I let the letters rest and reach for the bottle lying on top of them. It's an old soda pop bottle that I found on the street one afternoon, but it reminded me of Theo. When we were little, we'd write letters to our grandparents and stuff them into glass bottles that we'd then throw into the city harbor. We'd never even met our grandparents, and they passed away long before I reached French soil, but Theo loved talking about where those bottles might go. Think about it, Luce, he told me years ago. We were standing on a dock at the time, and he was staring across the bay and chewing on a piece of gum. He always had something in his mouth, gum or candy or a cigarette when he got older. Those letters could make it to Greenland or Iceland or all the way to Mama's old place in St. Malo. That's awfully far, I said. I didn't know where Greenland or Iceland were, but I did know that our mother had grown up in St. Malo, a whole ocean away. Not that far. I'll go there one day. You better bring me too, if you'll fit in my suitcase. Theo, I'm joking. He winked at me and I could see the traces of the bruise around his jaw that Papa had given him. Those bruises had been meant for me. I was the one who had burned the bakery croissants, but Theo had taken the blame when Papa saw the blackened trays. We'll buy a big fancy sailboat. Can we have a butler? He laughed. A butler? His name will be Sir Chive. That sounds fancy, doesn't it? He'd be British. You sure say some crazy things. When I blushed, he slung an arm around me. We'll call him Sir Chive, if that's what you want. Can we bring Mama with us too? We wouldn't leave without her. He didn't mention a word about Papa, and I didn't either. There was nothing to be said that we didn't already know, that we'd happily pile into a sailboat and turn our backs on Baltimore if that meant never seeing our father again. I placed the bottle back into the place and shut the drawer tight. Harkin has forbidden us to have any personal items at headquarters in case we're ever compromised, but Tilly and I have been discreet. In her own nightstand, she has hidden a small bottle of champagne that was a gift from Delphine and a silk handkerchief of her mother's that reminds her of home. Although home is a loose term in her case. Tilly's family has houses all over the world and in places I've never even heard of, like Porto and Catania. Nope, Catania, there it is. Her grandfather made a fortune in the fireworks business and now the Fairbanks family has some of the deepest pockets in all of America. Plenty to buy a seat in Congress for one uncle and a governorship for another. That's how her parents can afford their multiple mansions, though Tilly's considers only one place home, the Bouvier Academy for Girls. It's the boarding school in Paris where she's lived since she was seven. She can speak French like a native, and that's one of the reasons why Major Harkin tapped her for covert ops, along with her firsthand knowledge of explosives. She's our bang and burn specialist, demolitions and sabotage. Before I can ask Tilly about what she was up to tonight, there's a tap on the door. I sigh because it has to be Sabine. We'll keep our voices down, I call out, but the door opens and Sabine is nowhere in sight. It's Major Harkin. Both Tilly and I jump to our feet. Get to the meeting room now, Harkin says. Tilly hurries toward him, although I linger in place. Does he plan on giving me the sack in front of everyone? Come on, Harkin jabs a finger at me and I dart out of the bunk room. Is everything all right, Major? I ask slowly, but Harkin throws his hand up. No, nothing is all right. He snaps. Then in the chilly dimness of the hallway, he tells us something that makes my very bones shudder. We have a class one crisis on our hands. That's it for tonight, guys.